Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Center for Jewish Life Finance Forum. One of the many roles the CGL has assumed is to serve as a nexus between young Jewish professionals and talented, prominent leaders and role models in our community. Today, we're very, very lucky to have uh, one of those with us. Before I introduce Michael Sherwood, a quick note uh, about our sponsors uh, tonight, which is White & Case, one of the world's leading blue chip law firms. Uh, since their founding over a century ago, White & Case have developed a reputation for excellence as the, corp as the legal partner of choice in a number of industries and geographies, and they're also a coveted employer. So for the lawyers in the room, uh, their partners, David Becker and David Goldberg, are in the audience, and it's a very good time to make friends with them. Uh, and of course, the CJL is only able to subsidize events like this uh, because of the generosity of the donors and sponsors, so let's uh, thank them for that. It's now my very great pleasure to introduce Mike Sherwood. Uh, everybody knows Goldman Sachs is far and away the most successful investment bank in the world, and every Jewish mother dreams of it as the career destination <laughs> for her children. Uh, Mike graduated from Westminster School and Manchester University and joined Goldman in 1986. He rapidly, almost implausibly rapidly, rose through the ranks and became head of the debt syndication desk while still in his mid-20s. Subsequently, he ran the all-important fixed income, currency, and commodities division in Europe and held many other important posts. He is known as a consumer trader, a risk manager, and corporate leader. He is also a philanthropist, particularly in the fields of education and sport. We are very, very privileged to have him with us. Please join me in welcoming Mike in the traditional way. In terms of the format for tonight, Mike will be interviewed by David Whitkin, who is an executive director at Goldman. So if he does a good job, this is a good career move. Uh, <laughs> Dave, David works in the leverage finance uh, division. And after the interview, there will be Q&A. Mike, um, just starting at the beginning and um, your life before finance and Goldman, um, can you talk a bit about your upbringing and your, your childhood? Yeah, my childhood um, was very normal, very conventional. I grew up in, in Highgate with my sister, who's in the front row and has supported me all her life, and my parents. And you know, it was a very happy upbringing. My parents had a, had a terrific marriage, and you know, we, we, we had a very normal upbringing, I would say. I went to uh, Westminster School from the age of 13, which is a bit of an eye opener for me, I would say. It was uh, a school with extraordinary academic prowess and you know also opened my eyes up to lots of visiting speakers you know I remember as a kid uh, the Dalai Lama coming to Westminster and talking to the students so it, w it wasn't you know I, I was very privileged I think to go to Westminster I've stayed involved with Westminster ever since I left school when I was quite young I was still 16 actually when I did my A-levels and I took a semester out and went to the Hebrew University uh, in Jerusalem and uh, I did study a little bit of Hebrew at the time. I, I really don't remember much of it. I came back and enrolled uh, in Manchester University. And uh, I have to say, I wasn't the greatest student ever. Um, you know, but I, I somehow got through it and did reasonably well. And uh, you know, I joined Goldman straight out of university, uh, age 20. Who were your role models growing up? Growing up, you know, away from the normal soccer players that I admired, uh, my dad was definitely a role model to me. Um, you know, he's a very kind and generous man. Um, you know, he always had his family interests at heart. And from a very early age, I would say he installed a sense of community and family. And, and my mother also was, was very passionate about her family and is to this day. And, you know, there isn't a day that goes by when I don't speak to my mom. So, you know, I, I would say my role models were really within the family, I would say. And how did you end up actually getting into banking and, and Goldman Sachs? <laughs> I think quite by accident. I, I was at Manchester and I got a summer job at, uh, at Warburg's. And I was um, attached to the syndicate desk at Warburg's. And you know, I was sort of chief photocopier, coffee getter. I was probably 19 at this time. And we did a, a debt deal for Fannie Mae on the syndicate desk. Fannie Mae is a big US housing issuer. And my job was to take all the syndicate papers and, and to mail them out to members of the syndicate. 
and being you know, a little bit uh, devious, I kept all the names of the syndicate managers at all the other houses and ended up writing to them all and saying, look, I'm graduating next year. Uh, I'd really like to join the syndicate desk. Right. And I ended up interviewing at Goldman. And you know, even to this day, those of you who, who work at Goldman or have worked at Goldman know that it's uh, a very difficult and long and protracted interview process. But I saw there were probably only about 150 people at Goldman at the time, but I probably saw 20 of them in a two to three day period. And you know, in typical Goldman fashion, they said to me, OK, we're offering you a job, and you have to tell us by next Friday. So I went back to the very nice people at SG Warburg, and I said, look, I, you know, sorry to interfere with your process, but Goldman have made me this job offer, and they, I've only got literally 10 days to decide. And, and this personnel director at Warburg, who I really should be eternally grateful to, said, oh, here at SG Warburg, we make our decisions on April the 7th at 4 p.m., and we couldn't possibly alter the process. And you know what? I, I, I really thank that man forever, because SG Warburg is really no more, and, I, and, and the attitude and the sort of conviction with which Goldman hired people. And, and, and you've got to remember, you know, Goldman today in Europe, 7,000 people. We were about 150 in those days. We never bought any firm. We never merged with every, anyone. Every single one of those people we hired almost in the mode that I just described. And, and for me, that's the greatest strength of Goldman. It's one culture, one team. Everybody came in one by one. And you know, in, in, in my business, in financial services, most of the mergers that you see happening happen out of weakness, not out of strength. And one of the great strengths is we're able to keep a very pure culture at Goldman. If you think about your skill set growing up, did you ever consider a career doing something else? I, I don't think I really ever considered anything too seriously. I mean, you know, I, I, as I said, I, got, I lucked into this summer job, and, and from there, you know, I'd always thought perhaps I was going to be an accountant. In fact, I'd even accepted a job at one point at Deloitte or somewhere like that while I, before I interviewed with a bunch of investment banks. Um, so no, not really. I mean, I, I thought that there was a vein in me that was always about taking risk, I enjoyed taking risk, I enjoyed buying shares, maybe gambling a little bit as a, in my misspent youth. But uh, you know, I, I knew that was sort of the direction I wanted to go. And you know, the minute I could get out of accountancy, you know, and I, I remember using accountancy really as a way to pay my expenses coming backwards and forwards from Manchester to London. I'd go and interview with some firm because they'd pay your train fare. Uh, that was really all I thought of was, uh, was accountancy was for me. This is being taped in case I need to pay Deloitte or someone the train fare back. I'm sorry. <laughs> Look, I, I think uh, Vlad mentioned at the beginning, you, um, you know, how, how quickly you rose through the ranks at, at Goldman mm -hmm. in almost unprecedented fashion, mm -hmm. a partner at, at, at 28. Um, 29, actually. 20, <laughs> 29, um, and, and then various posts throughout, and, yeah. and becoming a leader of the firm in what is uh, pretty much meteoric style fashion. What do you think the key factors uh, have been to um, become that successful and that quickly? And how, how, have, you managed to, um, how, how have you managed to cope with an evolving set of responsibilities over time and in such quick fashion? The most amazing thing is my, my, my first really significant opportunity at Goldman came out of really terrible tragedy, which was my boss was killed on the Lockerbie flight going back to New York, and he was the head of syndicate. I guess that was in 1989, Christmas, maybe Christmas 89. And, you know, we were a very small team, but, you know, the people who were managing my business were all in New York, and they basically said, look, take this job. And so, literally, I'd been at the firm three years when I became the head of syndicate at Goldman in London. And my competitors were 35, 40 year olds, or, you know, it was, it, was, it was bizarre, really. And for some reason, you know, my ultimate boss in New York had confidence in me that I could do this job. And so, I became the head of syndicate at a very early age. And we went through a period where, you know, we really dominated the business. And Goldman Sachs was the you know, the new boy on the block. You know, we, in, in those days, the big firms were the Credit Suisses, CSFB, the UBSs of the world, Deutsche Bank, of course. American firms were getting started. But, you know, by the sort of early 90s, we'd graduated to being number one in the Eurobond League tables, which was the business that I ran. And, 
you know, I, I, I couldn't have ever imagined being as successful as, as we were at that time, but, you know, Goldman was just an incredible brand, great people, lots of smart people, and, you know, it was very iterative. We moved bit by bit, um, but I got enormous support from, from the U.S., and we were joking earlier. I mean, at that time, a lot of the British firms were failing or being merged into, into other entities. They didn't have the depth and the resilience and, and the raw financial muscle that we had coming from the deep U.S. capital markets to really fund the expansion of Goldman Sachs in Europe. You know, interestingly enough, you probably don't know this, but at the beginning of 94, I left Goldman. Uh, I left Goldman for two whole weeks, and I never had meant to leave Goldman, but, <coughs> you know, a, a, a very wealthy Swiss guy who had been one of the earliest investors in the Soros Quantum Fund went after me literally for a year and said, come start a hedge fund with me, very much like Danny Ock, who was, who was at Goldman, did with Oxif, for some of you who know it. He left right around the same time, and, and this guy, I mean, he's a multi, multi-billionaire to this day, you know, wanted me to go to Geneva and start a business with him. And I really didn't want to go. But he pursued me and pursued me and pursued me. And, you know, in the end, I guess Christmas 93, 93 was a phenomenally successful year for the firm, for, for the whole industry, really. You know, I went to Geneva and I had a meeting with him and sitting in his, his big office. And he said, look, enough. He said, you, you've evaded me for long enough. Um, tell me you know, what will it take for you to come? And I, I had a partner as well, another friend of mine who was working at Goldman at the time. And, you know, we went and had a walk around Lake Geneva and it came back with the most ridiculous set of terms. Um, we were starting a hedge fund in 93 with $2 billion of capital, which was an extraordinary amount even to start today. And the guy said, fine, let's go. And, I, you know, I was just blown away. And I guess, you know, I, I decided to resign. We bought a beautiful building in St. James's Square, or he bought a beautiful building in St. James's Square, which is the only reason I think he forgives me, because he paid about 15 million for a building that's worth over 100 million pounds today. Um, but after two weeks, I just said, look, this isn't for me. It wasn't what I wanted to do. And I was really fortunate, because a bunch of my colleagues at Goldman were calling me saying, did you really mean to leave? Come back, come back. And you know, my, my ultimate boss was, and, 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 and actually, he just rejoined the Goldman Sachs board in his early 70s. It was a guy called Mark Winkleman. He's just a fantastic guy, and he took me out for breakfast. Everyone calls me Woody after Sherwood Woody. He said, Woody, you've been on a long holiday. Come back. <laughs> I came back, and you know, I became a partner at the end of that year, and he told me, look, I'll treat you as though you went on holiday. But I, I actually left Goldman, you know, so my career started again in the beginning of 94, which was a horrendous year for the industry. It was the year the Fed started raising rates, for those of you, a history of... Uh, of economic policy. Maybe we'll get to see that again in, in the next week or so. Um, but it was a tough year, and my friend stayed at UBP, which it was, the De Pachotto family was the, was the guy who, who I mean did like unbelievably well. So, you know, if I marked to market a year on, it was a very poor decision. But uh, I don't think you can ever look back in your career. You can only look forward, and, you know, the last 20 odd years haven't been so bad. And we, we, we you, you talked a little bit about. Um, some of the support that you got from the U.S. and um, uh, from Mark as well. Yeah. Um, in in Pierre Avos or uh, Ethics of Our Fathers and uh, Mendy and Philippe uh, ensured that I, at this point. that I ensured that I mentioned a bit of Torah tonight. Um, it says, "Find yourself a teacher." And Goldman has a very strong mentor mentee um, culture. Who were your key mentors and and what advice um, did they give you which you <coughs> reflect on regularly? You know, as you know, Goldman Sachs was a true partnership and, you know, there was a culture of being a steward of the firm where, you know, the partners owned the firm for the time that they were partners and then they retired. One, one of the great things, by the way, about the expansion into Europe was, you know, many of the partners that funded our expansion into Europe not, never saw the benefits of it later. So, you know, they were extremely magnanimous with their own pocketbooks because they were making money in the US and investing in Europe. And really, it was only later generations who, who reaped the benefits. <coughs> but there were the many of, of my partners and people who started as my bosses who were great mentors to me. You know, one of, one of my earliest was Rick Goronzik, who, who actually moved over to, to London. I worked for him, and he was a very straightforward guy. But I always remember him telling me early on, he, he said, um, Woody, one of the great advantages of telling people the truth is you never have to remember what you told them. 
<laughs> and it's actually very good advice because you find in complicated financial institutions, especially when there's all sorts of jigsaws of moves, everyone's a little bit delicate with the choice, truth. And I think, you know, the, the, the reality is if you tell people up front what you want of them or what you expect and why you're doing things, it saves a lot of pain that later on, I would say. You know, Lloyd Blankfein, you know, has been my boss for the last 25 years and still is my boss, now the CEO of Goldman and, you know, it's someone I'm very close to. You know, I, I, you know, there's nothing I point to, you know, minute by minute, but, you know, I speak to him almost every day and, you know, he's just very wise, very direct, um, very straightforward. And look, I, I think the culture of Goldman is about that. It's about being, it's a can-do attitude. It's an attitude where, you know, you, you want to help each other, you want to get through things. I think y you never really get to, 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 to test the culture and the strength of an organization until you go through difficult times. And if you look at what happened to Goldman through 2008, which was an incredibly difficult time, and how quickly we recovered, um, you know, I think that really points to how well people put to get pulled together. An interesting thing I would say is, you know, this is my 30th year at the firm. You know, I would say I've probably had 25, 26 good years and four tough years. We've never had f two bad years in a row. You know, the, the firm is very resilient. It's very good at adapting to change. It's very good at adapting to whatever is thrown at us and you know I, I think it, 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 it's very differentiated versus versus other firms in that way uh, and people do pull together just reflecting on on what you said on 2008 you know undoubtedly for leadership most difficult times are during a crisis yeah what what was it like being a steward of the firm at that time and 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 what are the elements which you think uh, which you learned from that experience as a as a leader uh, which got well, the, the, first, the first thing I would say is, you know, as tough as those years were, you know, I, I lived through 94, as I explained to you, when it was a terrible year for the firm, the Fed started raising rates. I lived through 98 during the Russia crisis. I was the advisor to the Russian government. I, I lived that whole year, literally the summer in Moscow, in the White House in Moscow, advising them on their debt exchange. 08, which was the, the financial crisis in 2011, which was the European sovereign debt crisis. As tough as those four years were, funny enough, I wouldn't not have wanted to live them. I don't want to live them again, but <laughs> the, the, the experiences that you get living through those things are extraordinary, extraordinary. And, and, and you know, you'll never repeat them and you'll never see such stress and you'll never really see the true character of the people you work with. And the best way to assess how people are doing is not in a good market, it's in a tough market. And you learn so much about yourself, about people. These are the times that really count. And so, <coughs> you know, of course it was stressful and of course it was difficult. But the reality is I, I learned so much and I was exposed to so many things that I, I don't really want to erase those memories from my mind. And, you know, I find it extraordinary now, you know, we're seven, eight years on from the crisis. I'll go and talk to a room of graduates or associates or whatever, most of them are saying, what are you talking about? I mean, they've already forgotten, you know, what we lived through in 2008. I mean, we haven't forgotten, you know, our, our firm was resilient then. Today, the way we operate our firm, you know, a, lo a lot of it, um, a prerequisite for what regulators want from us around the world is leverage is dramatically different, capital's different, you know, the amount of liquid assets we hold on our balance sheet is different, but we've adapted and we became a bank holding company. Um, but the, the ability of our people to pull together, literally working night and day, you know, every uh, work stream that the Fed wanted, you know, Goldman Sachs people were on it. Uh, it it's extraordinary what the firm did. And, you know, uh, of course, you know, many people criticize us for it, but, you know, a lot of our senior partners went on to public service. Hank Paulson, obviously, who without him, I don't think we, we would have had as optimal an outcome as we ended up having. You know, Mario Draghi here, Mark Carney used to work for me for a long period of time, as is now the central bank governor in the UK. So, you know, Goldman has also been an enormous training ground for a lot of people who've gone on to do incredible work, I would say, in public service. And can you, can you reflect on, on some of the things that you would say you learn about um, leadership and also yourself during, during, during that time? I, I think I learned that... Uh, you can take a lot of bad days before you break. <laughs> and, you know, whenever you thought it was getting better, it wasn't. And, you know, the whole period of, of, you know, trying to be 
as upbeat as you possibly could be because it didn't matter how you felt internally, it mattered how you portrayed yourself to all the people that worked for you. And, you know, it, it, look, it was a very, very tough period. I never realized how interconnected our industry was. You know, I guess earlier in the year we'd seen Bear Stearns collapse, then we saw Lehman collapse, then we saw Merrill Lynch got sold. You know, I was talking to a kid uh, earlier from Morgan Stanley. I mean, I'd never cheered so much for Morgan Stanley. They seemed like, you know, the only uh, line in the sand between us being next. And it really didn't matter, you know, what, what your financial position was. You know, it was just a domino effect. And the interconnectedness and the, uh, the ability for investors to differentiate between firms w was very minimal. I mean, an interesting story at the time, of course, was that, you know, that was the time that we got Warren Buffett to invest in Goldman Sachs. And it's an extraordinary story because, you know, we, we'd spent time talking to Warren and he just had no interest. You know, he'd invested in Solomon Brothers years previously. And he really hadn't enjoyed that experience. But then, you know, we came in one Monday morning and there was like a one-page fax from Warren saying, okay, $5 billion, 10% coupon warrants at 115 preferred. You know, it was just like scribbled on, on and we weren't, we weren't even sure it was for real. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Byron Trott, who was our partner who covered him, you know, got our CFO in the room. And uh, David Vinia called, called Warren and said to him, you know, Warren, we, we, we see your facts. Look, could we make it a uh, tax deductible preferred? You know, it's much more efficient for us. And Warren said, David, there are only two answers to my facts, yes or no. <laughs> and, you know, at that point, Lloyd got on the phone with him and he said, um, you know, Warren, let, let me tell you what I'm worried about before you make this investment. Um, Lloyd starts talking. <laughs> Warren says, you know what, Lloyd, I've got to go take my grandkids for ice cream. I've really heard enough. You're worrying enough for the both of us. And this is how this debate happened. And he literally invested in us, you know, in a 24-hour period start to finish. And, you know, it, it, it turned out to be a great investment for him, a terrible security for us to issue. But the sense of relief, the fact that, you know, someone like Warren, Warren Buffett was giving his imprimatur on the firm at that time was extraordinary. And, you know, Warren came and walked the floors. You know, it was like having a, a pop star on the floors. I mean, people were cheering him and, uh, you know, obviously he, he made a lot of money out of the investment. Good, but God bless him. When, when, we, uh, when you think about when you started in 86 and, and you mentioned that the London, um, there were 150 employees in London. Yeah. Now uh, you're, you're a leader of a, a public company with 35,000 employees. Mm -hmm. We talk about the strength of the Goldman Sachs culture and yeah. values. How, how does one manage to maintain those type of principles and, and values with such extraordinary growth? Well, look, I, I think the first thing that we've maintained, which everyone said we wouldn't, is this partnership culture within a public company. We like the partnership culture. We like the responsibility. We like the fact that people pull together. So here we are in uh, 2015. We went public in 1999. Every two years, we still have a partner election. And so we've been through eight cycles. I chaired the partnership committee for four or five years and went through three of those cycles. You know, this is an extraordinary thing at Goldman Sachs. You know, people really care about becoming a partner. And, you know, you, you, you remember the day where you tell someone, or even more poignantly, where you tell someone they didn't make it. You know, they have to wait two years, or then maybe they won't make it again. You know, it, it's an extraordinary thing. And so the way our firm works is, you know, we try to look after our people first. And if there's any money left, we pay our partners. And if there isn't any money left, we don't pay them. And so the volatility of earnings in the partnership you know, which generally has been a good thing for people over multiple years if you take a long-term view. But, you know, they're the owners of the firm. And, 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 you know, it's obviously not like it used to be direct ownership pre-1999, but people really pull together. And I think the one thing that, that's uh, really differentiated us from our other competitors is that sense of commonality of interest, that sense that you're working together, that sense that the firm comes first, you have to subordinate your own interests for the firm. Other firms don't have it. Other firms, you know, in 2008, other firms were a revolving door of talent. People were leaving the whole time. Our management team's essentially the same. It's extraordinary. I mean, only Lloyd and, uh, and, and Jamie Dimon are the same CEOs, let alone the next 10 or 15 executives at Goldman are the same. JP Morgan, very few of them would be the same, I would say. What does your life entail outside of work? You know, I'm uh, pretty addicted to my family. Um, 
you know, I have a, a 21 year old, almost 21 year old son who's now at university in the States, so I see less of him than I, than I wanted to. He's a third year at Stanford. I have a 15 year old daughter who thinks she's 21, who takes up an enormous amount of time and effort and energy. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very involved in private investing. I invest in a lot of different businesses myself. Uh, I'm very involved in philanthropy, mainly as I think uh, you said around uh, sports and kids and education. Um, although I don't, I don't know if I should tell you, I'm on the board of Westminster Abbey, which comes out of my association with, with Westminster School, where I spent a fair amount of time on scholarships, but uh, I got pretty close to the Dean of Westminster, and so I, I worked with him. In fact, I was at a board meeting there this afternoon. Um, and I travel a lot. You know, and one of the things I'm responsible for at Goldman is our growth markets business. So, you know, I spent a fair amount of time on a plane to all the inverted commas BRIC countries that used to grow and now are really not growing that much. Um, but my, I, you know, I'm not bored. My life is uh, is pretty full, uh, and you know, it, it has a good balance to it. I would say. When when I look at some of the um, philanthropic activities, um, you know, I think there is a there's a table tennis charity, the Academy. Uh, which you set up as well. It all seems to have a kind of education type of theme to yeah. theme to it. Is that is that fair yeah, to say? I, th I think giving kids a chance in life is the best thing that you can do. And uh, you know, I'm fortunate to be involved in, a, in an academy school. We have 1,100 kids here. You know, our sports charity Greenhouse has 25,000 kids in its program. You know, I have a a home in in the West Indies in Grenada. You know, I don't know what possessed me, but I'm educating 10,000 primary school kids in Grenada right now in partnership with a global charity called Room to Read. I, you know, I support a lot of Jewish education initiatives as well. But, you know, I, 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 I essentially am multi-denominational in the, in the charities that I support, and, and I like to help underprivileged people and give them a chance in life. Westminster, the thing that I really spent time on was getting kids who couldn't afford it to, to, to Westminster. And uh, you know we don't we don't have enough of that. It's very hard. It's also very hard if you don't get kids early. It's very hard to put them into institutions like Westminster because they're so far behind. And you you know you can't put uh, you know people who don't have the right uh, primary school education into schools like that. So you have to get to kids young. I think. And just on on other interests, I mean, you have a you've had a pretty unblemished career in terms of um, risk management and leadership. Um, questionable about football team that you may support um, but you, you by the way I, I don't think that's true I, I haven't had an unblemished career in in risk management you know there yeah. were some very bad decisions that I made particularly in the 2006-7 period you know everybody did there was too much leverage in the system we lent too much money to specific LBOs and, and you know what we lost money but you know I think one of the things about Goldman is no one makes decisions by themselves we make we make them together but you know, let me tell you, I had a lot of sleepless nights, uh, risk managing positions that went very badly wrong for us. And you know, people who run big organizations like I do, no one could say they weren't responsible for things like that. And by the way, if they say they're not responsible, as some of the US chairman said of their firms, then they weren't doing their jobs. You know, at the end of the day, the responsibility sits with the people who run the organizations. Looking back um, at the sweep of your career and given your access to business leaders and your purview over the markets, what um, three pieces of advice would you give to young professionals about their careers? Have an insatiable demand for information and knowledge. Seek everybody out, not me after this. Prioritize your time, be relentless about you know, what you want to do with your time and, and, and prioritize what's important to you. And I would say lastly, certainly in my industry, people who try to sort of plan their careers out multiple years, almost always are disappointed. You know, seize the day, seize the opportunity. If you're good at what you do well, you know, in good organizations, you'll find new opportunities. Those would be the three pieces of advice. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike, for your enlightening remarks. Uh, you have acquired, I'm sure, over 100 keen students tonight. I once heard that training for a job takes many years. <laughs> Mistakes you make on your job and the lessons you learn is also worth many years, but experience counts for a lifetime. I'm sure Mike would agree that besides all else, one needs a little bit of muzzle, um, old-fashioned good luck. And it just so happens by muzzle that the Jewish calendar of, today, of today's date recalls a major event in Jewish history. 
It recalls the vindication and freedom of probably the most outstanding Jewish scholar of his generation, Rabbi Schneer Zalman, who pioneered a new philosophical dimension to cope with the modernist world. He used ancient texts but merged them with current philosophical ideas. And it became a textbook as to how people would obtain clarity of purpose with numerous psychological disciplines which prevails to this day. Naturally, the anti-Semitic Tsarist regime accused him of spreading revolutionary ideas, and he was ultimately freed from Tsarist prison 217 years ago today. His love and care for the whole of mankind was legendary. I'm sure that Mike carries some of those genes, and we'd like to thank his parents for bringing such an erudite son who has made such a good name for the Jewish people. Just in closing, I'd like to invite anybody who wishes uh, to take a menorah, a Hanukkah is this coming Sunday, night on your way out, uh, to spread a little light in Portland Place and beyond.